lesson this morning comes from Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voices go out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It rises, its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the ends of them, and nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold and even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from my hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transition, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our second lesson comes from Philippians 3 through 14. I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes from faith in Christ, 
the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. May God bless to our understanding this the reading of God's word, and to God's name be praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. It was just a week ago that our nation experienced the tragedy of another mass shooting by a lone gunman. 58 deaths, over 500 people wounded or injured. We can't even begin to count the number of concert goers who have been emotionally traumatized or count the number of family members and friends of victims whose lives have been so horribly touched. We can't even begin to count the number of police and first responders and volunteers who entered to save lives that day and who will be plagued by memories of what they saw for the rest of their lives. It ended with the shooter taking his own life, and I can't imagine how his family and friends must be struggling to understand this seemingly senseless but well-planned act. Sadly, mass shootings have happened far too often in this country and in other places abroad. While we are initially horrified, the emotion that we feel soon passes. We sort of fall back into that daily routine of living. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We all need to sometimes step back from high emotion to find a level of response and a level of feeling that is healthy. But the danger, the danger is that we become complacent and we begin to accept these tragedies as just part of our lives, part of our world. As expected, the mass murder in Las Vegas has rekindled the, the debate about gun control and mental illness. Should automatic weapons that were designed for soldiers in battle be sold over the counter? How do we keep weapons out of the hands of those who may be emotionally or mentally unstable? Do we need to improve our mental health system and find ways to detect these kinds of illnesses before they result in death? Do we need to have a common sense gun control system? I've noticed that in this particular case, the shooter in Las Vegas has turned the discussion in a few different directions. Should anyone be permitted to have this number of guns? And more puzzling, what was his motive? What was his purpose? From all outward appearances, he seemed to be well-adjusted, a successful businessman. So we ask, and we continue to ask, what was his background? What was his upbringing? What, was, what were the experiences that led him to so carefully plan this horrendous act? Authorities and experts are still looking for answers. But we want to know what molded and shaped him that caused him to act out so violently. And also asks us to maybe think a little bit what molds and shapes us, what molds and shapes our neighbors. Several months ago when I was filling out my worship planner for Kristen and Paula and Sue and looking at the lectionary readings for this Sunday, 
I was drawn to the passage from Philippians that Jerry read to us. In that passage, Paul is addressing one of the serious controversies in the early church, whether or not these new Christians would have to bring with them or adopt all the tenets of the Jewish faith, circumcision, dietary laws, temple rituals, and feast days. Paul is striving to help the church at Philippi work through this controversy, through this conflict, by pointing to his own experience. He said, first of all, I was born a Hebrew to Hebrew parents. I was from the tribe of of Benjamin, one of the two most respected tribes in all of Israel. I was raised in the law of Moses. I was a Pharisee by training. I learned the law. I was zealous, so zealous in my faith that I was willing to pursue heretics, including Christians. I could boast of many things in my day, said Paul. His birth, his education, his passion had molded and shaped him. Yet when he encountered the risen Christ on that road to Damascus, he was changed. He was transformed. Everything he had been was now seen in a new light, the light of Jesus Christ. And his whole life was now focused on Christ. So he could write, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul knew that when examining his life, he could identify that which he had inherited and that which he had achieved. I think all of us can do the same thing. We can point to those factors that have molded and shaped us. We can also point to those things that we've accomplished and achieved in life. So how are we molded? How are we shaped? What was given to us and what did we earn? None of us had any choice about where we were born or when we were born. I often wonder what my life would have been like if the circumstances of my birth had been different. I was born in New Jersey to middle-class parents. My father was a, a skilled machinist. He was a veteran of World War II. My mother came from a family that owned a small business. And I was, as my mother used to say, born about nine months after my father got back from the war. How would my life have been different if I was born to a single mother of color in the poorer sections of Newark, New Jersey? Rather than going to a school where I got a lot of individual attention by good teachers, if I had attended an inner city school where just showing up on a regular basis was an achievement in itself. How much did my white skin and my middle class background paved the way for my education and life direction. And what about you? What advantages or disadvantages did you encounter growing up? How did they mold and shape you? Parents, education, the opportunities to be involved in sports or scouts or community activities, all these and more help mold and shape us. And we can't take credit for a lot of them. They were just given to us while growing up. Think of all those who did not have access to those same advantages, those advantages of childhood, those advantages which came through the accident of birth. I was fortunate to be the first one in my family to go to college. Now, college was more affordable for middle-class families in the 60s. Scholarships and educational grants helped along the way. But I am the poster child for what you would call white privilege. Doors were open to me because of my skin color and my family background. Now, not that we didn't have to work hard, not that things were just dropped in our laps, but it was easier for me and those like me 
than that child of color born in Newark, New Jersey. Throughout life, we are also molded and shaped by the person we choose to, as a partner, children, our work, our activities. We're molded and shaped by our health. And let's not forget the molding and the shaping that God provides. It starts, hopefully, when we're children and we hear the stories of the Bible and the stories of Jesus. That's why we need to keep telling those stories. And it continues as we're taught right from wrong, good from evil. It continues as we learn about prayer and Bible reading and worship and service and social justice and discipleship. Some of us may be like Paul. We've been headed down, we've been heading down one path of life, seemingly grounded in the traditions of our ancestors, and suddenly we're given a new understanding of what God is calling us to be and to do. We are reborn, we are transformed, a radical molding and shaping. But others of us are like Timothy. Timothy raised in the faith by loving parents and grandparents, seemingly knowing Christ from the first breath we take, growing in the knowledge and the love of our Lord as we grow physically, mentally, and spiritually. I believe that God does have a plan for each one of us. It's written, but it's not written in stone. It's not written so that all we have to do is read from the script. I think God paints with a broad brush and gives us the tools to mold and shape our lives. We are the ones who fill in the details and the ones who choose to follow God's path or not. May we recognize the gifts and the privileges that we've been given. Let us affirm and recognize that others may not have been so blessed. And let us celebrate, but only with humility, what we have achieved. And may we in love help mold and shape our children and those around us. Amen. And now go in peace. May the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be and abide with you this day, this night, and indeed forevermore. Amen.